Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me OK in the back there? Yeah? Hi. Um, my name's Kevin McLaughlin. I'm the dean of the faculty here at Brown. I'm a professor in uh, comparative literature and English and German studies, which is, I think, why I'm introducing the speaker tonight. <laughs> Not as a dean, but as a, a literary scholar. Um, but um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight and uh, to be able to welcome our speaker. I, I had a look at um, the um, lecture series that we've been uh, so fortunate to have uh, uh, Chris Rose putting together here for the last few years, the, the Thinking Out Loud series. And I, I guess I hadn't really noticed this quite before, but the, the first sentence of the description of the, pro of the program says, scientists and engineers are often perceived as living intellectual lives that are mysterious simultaneously wondrous and arcane. I'm sure Chris wrote that. Um, and as I was trying to prepare to introduce our speaker tonight, I was reading CV and uh, Googling around uh, on the internet. I would definitely say that it, it seemed like her life was wondrous and arcane, uh, especially to me who know very little about the substance of her work. But I would also say that she's very busy. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's amazing uh, the, the number of different kinds of activities and organizations that um, she's involved in. Um, and you know, I would say that it's really a characteristic of the speakers that we've had come in the series, that they are really um, amazing examples of people who are doing cutting edge scientific research, training graduate students, working with undergraduates, giving lectures in high schools and elementary schools, uh, and um, you know, at the same time remaining um, engaged at the, at the level of the profession, which is so important, encouraging young uh, scholars to, um, to, 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 to take on those, the challenges of doing uh, PhD work in the sciences. Um, and especially from, um, from, um, for uh, young scholars who may come from groups that have traditionally not participated in high levels in those, in those uh, endeavors. So um, it's a special pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Gilda Barbino. And I will just um, list a few of, of her, um, her positions and, and accomplishments. Uh, before I turn it over to my, my colleague, Chris, Chris Rose. Um, she is currently the Dean and the Berg Professor at the Grove School of Engineering <clears throat> at the City College of New York. She has faculty appointments in biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, uh, and also an appointment at the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education uh, slash CUNY School of Medicine. Uh, prior to CUNY, she was the Associate Chair of Graduate Studies um, and a professor in the Wallace uh, H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech in Emory. Uh, at Georgia Tech, she also served as the Vice Provost, the inaugural Vice Provost for Academic Diversity. Um, prior to her appointments at Georgia Tech and Emory, she rose to the rank of full professor in, of chemical engineering and served as Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at Northeastern University. Um, her research is on sickle cell disease, as I'm sure most of you know, um, and on cellular and tissue, tissue engineering. And she also has spoken widely and participated in important discussions around race and ethnicity and gender and science and, and engineering. As I said, if you go on the internet, you'll see the number of venues she's been invited to speak at. I won't list those, uh, list those here, um, but um, I will say that um, there's some really excellent uh, video interviews of her on the web if you'd like to learn more about uh, her ideas about um, diversity in higher education. Um, so Dr. Barabino is also the immediate past president of the, um, let's see, the BMES, which is the Biomedical Engineering Society, uh, and president-elect of AIMBE, which is the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. She has um, over a decade of experience in leading NSF initiatives for women and minority faculty, and she's the founder and executive director 
of the National Institute for Faculty Equity. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Barabino and before that to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Rose to uh, welcome her as well. Thank you all for coming tonight. Okay, so you know the, the uh, first thing that I always ask at these things is how many people have been to a thinking uh, out loud before? Right, so you know, a significant number. So for those of you that haven't been, Rod, Rod have you ever been to one of these? Of course, of course, right, that's a silly question to ask. Uh, so the interesting thing about this series is that, you know, we could bring all sorts of people in here that were just, uh, that were good at, their, good at what they did. But we're looking for a particular type of mind, one that synthesizes across a variety of different areas. So, you know, I knew of Gilda for a long time, but hadn't met her actually, you know, face to face until today. And the, what I guess I found really interesting about Gilda in particular, and as it, uh, you know, relates to this series, is what I always say for those recidivists here, that we look for a certain kind of crazy. Right? Now, we, honest to God, we're, that, that's, those are the best scientists, the ones who reach across areas that people never thought were connected and can connect them. So now, Gilda is, Gilda is most definitely fits that bill, but, it is the, but there's this essence. I guess the only way to say it is Gilda is a warrior. I mean, I've never, I've never met anybody like her, but she's the most effective warrior I've ever seen. She kind of seeps into intellectual spaces and binds things together, applies what we do as scientists to a variety of different things, and somehow it all fits together and somehow she's all still standing. As Kevin said, she's the most busy person, uh, if you look at her CV, uh, that you've seen. So, you know, with that, I guess I'm, I'm really kind of, I didn't realize how in awe I was going to be, but I'm really in awe. So thank you for coming. And, you know, please help me welcome Gilda Barabino for Thinking Out Loud. Good evening. So first of all, I'd like to thank Kevin and Chris for the very kind introduction and the warm welcome. Thank all of you for being here, and I'd like to thank um, Brown University for putting on this distinguished lecture series, and I can't tell you how privileged I am to be one of the speakers in this series. Today I thought I'd tell you a bit about my own journey with the question in mind, what is it about cell mechanics that can help us unlock the mysteries of disease? And I thought I'd start out by telling you a little bit about my own pathway to come to this question, which has uh, been pretty much my life's work uh, for my professional career, and how I have then used that in, in the work that I've done historically and the work that um, is going on presently. So my pathway to this work in the area of looking at the ties that bind and how do we unravel disease uh, through biomechanics. I was born into a military family. My f mother and father hailed from New Orleans. My father joined the military after high school. I was born in Anchorage, Alaska, and um, moved around the country. But when my father was ready to retire, he moved the family to New Orleans. And in New Orleans, I attended high school at Benjamin Franklin High School, and I attended um, undergraduate at Xavier University of Louisiana. And it was at Xavier that I first became interested in medicine. Xavier is very well known. It's uh, the only black Catholic university in the country, but it's also very well known for producing the most African Americans who are admitted to and, and finished from um, medical school. So I started out as a pre-med chemistry major, and I was very much interested in pursuing um, medicine, but maybe not as a clinician. So if you're not interested in doing medicine as a clinician, um, what would you do to contribute to medicine? So I thought I would approach medicine through engineering. I uh, was the first African-American admitted to the graduate program in chemical engineering at Rice University. 
And when I was admitted there in 1981, it was only 15 years after they admitted the first blacks at the undergraduate and graduate level to Rice University. But it was at Rice where I honed my desires and my skill sets and capabilities around using engineering principles towards problems in medicine. After uh, Rice, I started my academic career at Northeastern. And while there, when I was on my first sabbatical, I did it at MIT uh, with Robert Langer and started another area of research uh, in tissue engineering. And I still do some work in orthopedic tissue engineering. And then as you've heard earlier, I also um, was on the faculty at uh, Georgia Tech and Emory. And then now currently in my position at the Grove School of Engineering as uh, Dean of Engineering. But I maintained throughout my career this interest in looking at the connection between cellular biomechanics and disease. And it's very interesting that with the onset of disease, there's unique cellular changes. There's a lot that we can learn from the changes in mechanical properties of cells that can tell us about not just how the disease started, but how it progresses. I have done works particularly in the context of uh, osteoarthritis and sickle cell disease. So if we look at altered structures and properties in cells as it relates to what happens with disease, we can learn from that and understand more about the pathophysiology of that disease and that can give us instruction towards therapies. An example of Osteoarthritis, for example, we know there's cartilage re, uh, degeneration. The cell type, of course, is the cartilage cell, the chondrocyte. Those cells become stiffened of mechanical property. We understand, I'm sure many people have problems themselves, maybe with knees and um, or know of people who have problems with cartilage degeneration. And we know that one of the primary strategies is around um, joint replacement. I'll tell you more uh, further in the talk about sickle cell disease, but just to recap it from the point of view of learning about cell biomechanics, there's a defect in terms of uh, polymerization of hemoglobin in the red cell, which leads to vasoocclusion. There, the problem with the cells is the stiffness of the cells and also increased adhesivity of the cells, blockage of vessels that causes a host of problems. Right now, <clears throat> a primary Drug treatment is hydroxyurea. It's genetic uh, disorder, so many of the therapies that we do, they're not curative, but they can address symptoms. And there's also one uh, approach that is curative is a bone marrow transplant. So let's talk a little bit more about the cells. The cells are very um, adept at sensing their mechanical environments, and they interact very well with the matrix that they secrete. And in particular, because they can sense the biomechanical um, background, including the, the matrix, and including properties like stiffness, that allows the cells to change their behaviors accordingly. And again, it's those kinds of uh, ways that the cells behave that we can learn from to tell us, to help us tap into what's going on with the disease. So I'm going to give you some um, information around some of the studies that we've done in my laboratory around cartilage tissue engineering and use that as an example by a way of how cells respond to forces. But for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on using sickle cell disease as a way to explain to you the story and the connection, the interplay between cell mechanics and disease. But for um, chondrocytes, for example, they secrete their matrix in response to uh, mechanical forces. And one of the things that we looked at in particular in my laboratory, we used this novel wavy wall bioreactor. What this bioreactor allowed us to do was to introduce fluid mechanical environments of different types um, onto uh, growing cells and tissue. So we have these developing tissue constructs where we have cartilage cells seeded onto biodegradable scaffolds. They're in our bioreactors and now they're surrounded by fluid mechanical forces. What we learned from that is how the cells respond. And here's one example. So in response to the mechanical forces, the cells that were secreting matrix closest to the surface, the ones that are more in contact with the 
fluid mechanical force. If you look at the uh, alignment of the, the fibers, what you'll see that here, the collagen fibers that's in the matrix secreted by the cells are aligned with the flow. But in the interior, where they're further away from the mechanical force of the flow, you see this disoriented uh, uh, in arrangement. So that's something that we can learn from the mechanics about cellular behavior in response to mechanical forces. So now I'd like to, to move on and tell you more about the connections between sickle cell disease and biomechanics. To do that, I would like to first give you a bit of a primer about sickle cell disease so you'd have a better understanding of how the mechanics uh, um, works in terms of the interplay. Sickle cell disease is actually a family of disorders with abnormal sickle hemoglobin. And the de defect basically is there's one amino acid substitution in the uh, beta chain of a hemoglobin molecule. And that one amino acid substitution causes the hemoglobin molecules to, rather than stay separated, to aggregate under deoxygenated conditions. And what you then get is cells that are now sickled in shape because of the uh, polymerized hemoglobin. And that causes a whole host of, of problems. There are other diseases that there's sickle hemoglobin, but not just sickle hemoglobin. There's also, there's SC, so there's sickle hemoglobin and C hemoglobin, as well as thalassemia. The most prevalent would be sickle cell anemia that's all sickle hemoglobin. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the disease so you can understand the importance of uh, better understanding the pathophysiology. There's 3.2 million people who have the disease worldwide, 100,000 of which live in the United States. And there's an economic burden associated with the disease. About a million dollars is, is the estimate for the total lifetime of health care cost, uh, over 10,000 for annual cost for children, and 30,000 annual cost for adults. Sickle cell disease is global, and in this chart, what you see is the number of newborns with sickle cell anemia across the world in 2015. And you see the darker regions have a higher incidence of sickle cell disease, and it's not surprising that there's a higher incidence in equatorial regions. The disease was thought to be a mutation that evolved in response to becoming a protection to uh, malaria. I'd like to tell you a little bit more. If you think about um, how the disease is manifested and what happens within society, looking at the life expectancy for sickle cell disease, the average age is about 40 for life expectancy or mid-40s, and it's slightly higher for women than men, about 45 versus 43. And I'd like to draw your attention to a number of things that have happened over time. In 1972, there was a national Sickle Cell uh, Act, it was passed by Congress, and that act actually was directed towards having more research, education, training, and screening around sickle cell disease. At that time, I was in high school, and I remember there were a number of community activities, there were fairs, health fairs, where there would be screening around the disease. But even with all of the um, studies that have been done and as much information that we know, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And I will bring it back to looking at biomechanics to answer some of those questions. If we look at the pathophysiology of the disease, we need to understand that the hemoglobin polymerization that's in response to this uh, genetic defect, the one amino acid substitution, causes these cells to take on a sickle shape. The polymerization that happens under deoxygenated environments is actually reversible. So that at any given time, cells with sickle hemoglobin can go from oxygenated to deoxygenated, sickle to unsickled. After uh, repeated cycles of sickling, many of these cells become irreversibly sickled and cause a number of problems in the circulation. So if you think about a sickled cell hemoglobin polymerized and the difficulty that it might have in the circulation in comparison to a normal cell, it's amazing uh, in terms of properties. So a normal red blood cell, nature has this fantastic uh, design uh, for the normal red blood cell. It's a viscoelastic membrane, biconcave shape, and it surrounds an aqueous solution of hemoglobin molecules. That normal red cell is about eight microns in diameter.
And that structure I just explained to you allows that red cell to be extremely deformable, it's not stiff, and it can fold over on itself and pass through vessels, capillaries for example, that have a diameter that's half the size of the diameter of a red cell. So that's something that we can learn from looking at normal situations and then looking at the disease state that um, deviates from normal. We also found that for sickle cells, the sickle red blood cells, not only were they different in stiffness in the way that they um, uh, can block vessels because of stiffness, they also are abnormally adherent. So they can adhere to each other and they can adhere to the endothelial cells that line the vessel walls. So you have a problem, not just mechanical obstruction of a vessel, but also related to adherence. So we have models of adherence where you can have sickle red blood cells adhering to a vessel wall and maybe not causing a blockage just by itself um, adhering, but if they adhere over a period of time and then there are other cells that come behind them that now cannot pass through the circulation because they're um, adhering or interacting with these cells that adhere to the vessel walls, you have another uh, form of blockage. And so that's what this one shows you. And this third model says not only can you get trapping related to sickle red blood cells adhering, other blood cell types like a white blood cell could participate in the blockage and we are trying to understand that as well. So before I talk to you about some of the engineering approaches that we've taken, I want to give you a little bit more of a sense of the manifestations of the disease related to the vascular occlusion, which is the hallmark of the disease. It occurs systemically since the red cells are responsible for carrying oxygen to the tissues. If there's a defect in that and they're no longer able to carry the oxygen to the tissues the way they normally do because vessels are obstructed, the oxygen doesn't get to the tissues. What happens to the tissues? They die, basically. So now you've got organ damage. And the more uh, an organ has small vessels that are more prone to blockage, the more organ damage that you'll have. So some of the clinical manifestations that you see in the different uh, systems, one in particular in the cardiothoracic system is uh, acute chest syndrome. There's also other things that happen when you have vessels blocked in the brain, for example, stroke. There are things that happen in the reticular endothelial system, um, like spleen sequestration. The spleen has so many small vessels that in sickle cell patients, their small vessels and capillaries in the spleen become so blocked that they're effectively splenectomized. It's like they don't have a spleen. And then in other um, systems, there's problems in the uh, musculoskeletal system, particularly in blood circulation within bones, you have what we call infarcts in the bones, you, you're not getting oxygen to the tissues, patient experiences that is extreme pain. There's also problems in the urogenital system and the gastrointestinal system. So let's tie this back to cell mechanics. When the structure within the cell, uh, and you have hemoglobin polymerizing within the cell, it often pulls at the membrane, and for sickle cells you now can have proteins that normally might be embedded and not be exposed, be exposed because of that sickling process. You have cell shapes and changes, and it absolutely makes a difference in terms of mechanical properties like stiffness, deformability, and adhesivity. We also know that it's not even just one particular um, cell stiffness or, or uh, cell shape that's prevalent in sickle cell disease. So we've classed that there's actually four different classes based on their biomechanical properties and their density. They can be young cells or reticulocytes, which are the young red blood cells that are coming right out of the marrow. They're, they tend to be more deformable and less um, of the hemoglobin polymerization. They're discocytes, there's uh, dense discocytes, and the ones that I mentioned to you that are permanently damaged that are irreversibly sickle cells. So we're interested in those populations of cells as well. Now we want to use an engineering approach so that we can exploit these mechanical properties and we can also exploit fluid mechanics to better understand what's happening in the disease. So what we've used over uh, time is 
a parallel plate flow chamber system, so the parallel plate flow chamber is mimicking a vessel, we can culture endothelial cells that line the vessels on these um, plates, and then we can perfuse them with blood samples or uh, blood suspensions to mimic what's happening in the vessels. We can take advantage of, we know what happens, um, what it looks like um, statically, apply shear stress, and we know there's gonna be this deformation in, in response to stress. But we can also use this flow system to look at adhesive properties. And much of my early work was devoted to how do we understand adhesive interactions between individual sickle red blood cells and the endothelial cells lining the vessels in a way that it's gonna give us some clues towards what's happening with vaso occlusion and maybe actually help us have predictions around when a patient might be um, headed towards a crisis, which is when the, the vessels are completely blocked. So one of the earliest studies that actually came out of my um, thesis was we looked at a combination of cells that were from patients in, living with sickle cell disease. We also looked at cell, red blood cells that were normal, but we mechanically damaged them. And we mechanically damaged them so that they would have mechanical properties similar to sickle cell properties. And the damage mostly was within the membranes. And what we found in looking at those cells, as, as well as um, cells, red blood cells from page, people who were not patients, they were carriers of the disease, sickle trait. And what we found was that the most adhesive, that of course you would expect to have the most problems with vaso occlusion, were those were for sickle cell patients. We, when we looked at the separate, I told you there were the separate categories based on the density and the stiffness of the cells. When we looked at the separate categories, what we found was that the younger, more deformable cells, the reticulocytes, were more adhesive than the more damaged cells. This was in contrast to what had been seen through static adhesion assays, because the static assays said that the more damaged cells were actually more adherent. The lesson that we learned there is that you need to do these experiments under physiological flow conditions. The static conditions did not tell you enough about what's happening in the physiological sense. So we found that under dynamic conditions that mimic those in the body, the reticulocytes, the younger cells, which was not what you were expecting, were actually pay, playing a bigger role in vaso occlusion. So when we look at um, other aspects as it relates to therapies. What I want to show you here is one of the drug treatments. Let's see if we get that to come right. So it had been for quite a period of time only one. FDA approved drug for sickle cell disease, and that was the hydroxyurea. Only recently there's been another drug approved, and that's uh, a glutamine that's only recently been approved. But for the most part, one of the major uh, therapies that was afforded to sickle uh, patients was hydroxyurea. So in one of these early studies, we were trying to better understand using this system what's the mechanism, how does um, hydroxyurea work? It doesn't work for all patients and it doesn't work all the time. But patients who were on hydroxyurea had less vaso-occlusive crises. And so what we found in this study was that those who, we, we looked at adhesion for those before they were on the drug and then after they were on the drug. And what was shown here is as early as two weeks after drug treatment, their adhesion went down to levels of normal. And what you see here in this uh, flow in micro uh, a fluidic device is this one is for a patient who is on hydroxyurea. And see the difference between that flow and the flow here where the patient is not on hydroxyurea. So we're learning something about the fluid mechanics and how there's a response to a, a drug therapy from that work. Another thing that we were using to look at therapeutic approaches by understanding the uh, fluid mechanics of the system was we know that we can better understand the interactions between the um, 
sickle cells and the endothelial cells line in the blood vessels if we understand the molecular mechanisms. So what um, molecular mechanisms are, are, are accounting for the adhesion? So what about the surface of the red cell and the surface of the endothelial cell? So in one study, we looked at anionic polysaccharides as a way to uh, be an anti-adhesion therapy because it turns out sulfated glycolipics that can be exposed on the membrane of a sickle red blood cell, they not, may not necessarily be exposed normally, they can be inhibited uh, by anionic polysaccharides. So in this study, what we found was that this one particular anionic polysaccharide, this high molecular weight form of dextran sulfate, was very effective in blocking adhesion. In another study, we looked at an uh, receptor on the endothelial cell that was called alpha V beta 3 and saw that antagonist to that receptor which was the EM these two MD compounds actually blocked adhesion so why is that important if you understand these molecular mechanisms of adhesion and you find ways to block them that can form the basis of a drug therapy So we've done, what I've been showing you is um, in vitro studies where we're using human uh, endothelial cells and we're also using uh, human uh, patient samples. But we also learn what's going on uh, from a fluid mechanical point of view by using mouse models. This study was done outside of my lab, but in this particular case, they were using a mouse model to mimic um, adhesion. And this intravital microscopy, the first one that you're going to see is an inflamed vessel, but the SA was, it's a wild type, so it's basically a control, so it's not sickle cell disease. But here's what they were showing, that white blood cells could adhere to inflamed vessels. And so now we're looking at a sickle mouse with inflamed vessels, and they've already, the inflamed vessels already had these white cells adhere, and now they're, they're perfusing sickle red blood cells, and we're trying to get a better understanding of how sickle red blood cells interact with white blood cells that are now interacting with the vessel wall. And what we're finding here is that the sickle cells can then actually adhere to the white cells that are adhering to the vessel wall. So not only can red cells adhere directly to the vessel wall, if there are white cells present, the, the sickle cell can adhere to an adherent white cell. And again, we're using fluid mechanics to better understand the process of vaso-occlusion and what cell types are participating. What's good about the in vitro system that I mentioned to you, now we can dissect out. So what you just saw in the intact intravital microscopy system was these cells participating. But which white cells are participating and at what level? So now in our in vitro system with the parallel plate flow chamber that I showed to you, we're going to replicate what we just saw in the animal model, and we're going to dissect it out to see what's happening. So we are also perfusing white cells and then the red cells, and we're examining this in a video microscopy system, and we're looking at different fields, and we're going to look to see which uh, white cells might be playing a, a bigger role. So this is just um, the in vitro system that you can see we're mimicking the flow and we here as well can see white cells that were adherent and then red cells adhering to the white cells. Because we could dissect out and look at different suspensions, we were able to show which white cell type was playing a bigger role and it turned out the neutrophils were playing a bigger role in white, just white cells adhering to the endothelial cells. And importantly, I showed you earlier what happens um, with adhesion when patients were on uh, hydroxyurea. So here we also looked at patients who were on hydroxyurea, and we found that they had not as much adhesion as not on hydroxyurea, but more so than if it was a normal situation. So again, we're getting clues, and in this case, we're actually looking at um, the ability of those white cells to capture red cells, similar to what we saw in the in vivo case. And here we saw that these neutrophils um, played an important role in capturing the um, sickle cells. And again, the patients who are on hydroxyurea, hydroxyurea seems to serve as 
somewhat of a mediator that ameliorates that um, what you see for patients on the, uh, with sickle cell disease who are not on the, uh, receiving hydroxyurea treatment. So that gave you a sense of how do we use the different mechanical property related to adhesion to better understand the process around vasoocclusion, what happens in a therapeutic setting, and um, what types of cells might be playing a role in that adhesion. Now I'm going to turn um, attention to other studies that we were doing to exploit the mechanical properties of the, the sickle red blood cells. In this case, our goal is, we're still working on this, but in this case, our goal is to come up with a device where we can separate cells based on their mechanical properties. We know there are different types of um, subpopulations of red cells for sickle patients. And we also know that if you understand the percentage of different types of cells and maybe at a different uh, point in time, it may give you a clue to how severe the disease is or the progression of the, dis excuse me, of the disease. So in this case, we are using simulations uh, of flow channels and cells of different stiffness in the flow channels. So the red cells are representing normal uh, stiffness or normal red blood cells of that level of stiffness. And the blue ones are actually representing cells that are um, more stiff, and they would represent the sickle cells. So one of the things that we can see in this animation uh, from the simulation is that the cells that are stiffer in channels are going to marginate and go to the uh, surfaces. So they're going to uh, push out. So if we're trying to devise a device that will allow us to separate cells based on their stiffness, better understanding this through simulations uh, in terms of what are the properties and how do stiff cells behave under flow, this is uh, one way of doing it. And that's what this simulation is actually showing us. What is the behavior? Now that we understand that through a simulation, we can then through the simulation, put in different populations of cells with different percentages of the stiff cells and the cells that are not as stiff. And we can use, we can change the geometry of the uh, channels. We can change different parameters in simulation that would approximate the kinds of shear stresses that you might um, see uh, in the body. And this one just gives you a sense of simulating how cells are moving, different groupings of cells, different levels of stiffness, and different um, configurations. And the next few slides that I'm going to show you are, are static images. But what they show is that if you, through your simulation, if you change the internal viscosity of the cells, you can see differences in how they move within the channel. We see that regardless of the viscosity, that the red cells uh, will, the ones that are less stiff will stay closer in the channel center, and the ones that are more stiff will uh, spread to the surface. We look at um, the different cell types, and again, we can see the different patterns if you have different mixtures. And we also look at things if, if you change parameters like changing the rate of shear, and you will see differences as well. And what we found is that if you were trying to maximize your ability to separate cells based on the level of stiffness, that you would use higher uh, shears. So that's good to have simulations, but you also want to have some experiments to back up or confirm the simulations, and you want to absolutely um, eventually come up with an actual device. So this is an uh, early stage device where based on the, the simulations uh, that I just showed you and the properties that we found in the parameters, these are ways of having particular outlet systems where you can in fact separate the cells based on the level of stiffness. And there's been some experiments to uh, demonstrate that. And so far, the experimental results have been uh, corroborating the kinds of things that we've seen uh, through the simulations. So the next step here would be to further refine this device. Once the device is working, we would actually 
take blood samples from a patient with sickle cell disease, run it through the device, do the separation, and collect the cells of the different levels of stiffnesses and look for clues how you can correlate that around um, disease progression. And the last uh, area that I'd like to talk to you about is some other studies that we've been doing in the laboratory more recently, and these are specifically looking at bone for um, patients with uh, sickle cell disease. Bone is one of the most understudied tissues for sickle cell disease, and we know if you can imagine, you've got a problem, as I mentioned earlier, with the red blood cell. The red blood cell is a in the vasculature, so it's going to affect every organ and every tissue. Not only that, the blood cells are emerging from the bone marrow. And so there's no way that you would expect that there's not going to be problems with the bone. What we want to do, because it hasn't been done uh, in an extensive way, was actually look at mechanics as it relates to bone. For these experiments and these studies, we used a sickle transgenic mouse, so the mouse is transgenically ma manipulated to express sickle hemoglobin. And through this, we're going to look at the bone uh, phenotype for uh, sickle. We're using a micro CT so to look at imaging, and the micro CT allows us to look at the um, structure of the bone in a way that we would not be able to if we did not have these kinds of um, images, and we're combining this micro CT with uh, mechanical testing. The bone type that we're looking at is the mouse femur, and it turns out that the mouse femur in many studies has been shown to be a decent model for human uh, bone behavior. And in this uh, mouse femur, we've been looking at uh, the cortical ring and the trabecular bone. And here's some of the um, well, I'll sh show you next some of the results, but to give you a sense of what we were doing, we were looking at 10-week-old um, and 21-week-old um, mice, and the 21-week-old mice are approximating uh, at least adolescents and adults with sickle cell disease. And the reason why it's important to look at the mice in uh, older mice and try to approximate what happens with aging, there's so much in-organ damage for those with the disease the older you get, the more end organ damage there's going to be. And so we're looking at these um, areas of the bone. This is from the micro CT, and we use this cortical region for mechanical testing. And again, 10 weeks and 21 weeks. And here's some of the, the findings. So normal or uh, wild type mice, uh, these are mice that are um, trait mice, so they have some sickle and some normal hemoglobin, and these are the sickle mice. This is 10 weeks. Look at the difference in the structure um, at 21 weeks. So you're going to get some deterioration with respect to aging normally. We were surprised actually to see this much change for trait because trait is carriers and they're asymptomatic basically. But this is a dramatic change for sickle and sickle with age. We did what we call a four-point uh, testing to look at mechanical strength and other uh, mechanical properties uh, based on this mechanical testing at using this uh, part of the long bone. And I'm going to show you some results from that next. Top, this is 10 weeks. And the bottom is 21 weeks. And some of the things that we saw when we looked at stiffness, and we looked at um, the yield, and we also looked at um, the, the maximum force it took to break the bone. What I'd like to draw your attention to that sickle is, has this decreased stiffness, and sickle um, broke with uh, less force. But surprisingly, it had this higher um, post-deflection yield. And we saw the same kind of trend um, with age. So one of the things that we think about, why is it that we know the sickle bone is going to be more fragile? And why is it that in sickle cell patients, we actually don't see as many fractures as you might see with someone with osteoporosis, for example, yet the bone, especially from a microarchitectural uh, level, looks osteoporotic? Uh, 
but why are there not as many um, fractures reported anyway? So we thought that maybe this yield gives us some idea of what might be going on, and this would be another example of understanding a mechanical property in a way that it can help you understand disease. So it could be that the bone that is there is a bit more pliable. And so that maybe serves as a compensatory mechanism so that that bone is, it, even though it seems more fragile, it's not as prone to breakage as it would be if it didn't have that level of yield. We don't know that for sure, but that's something that we could look at um, in the future. This just sort of sums up um, what we just talked about, that if you have this level of, of what the bone structure might be. This is my, what it might look like normally as you get to our early adulthood, but this is what you look like when you have the complications of a disease like sickle cell disease and how it impacts the bone. We are looking for as many clues as we can get from these mechanical studies so that they can help inform those on a clinical side who are uh, actually uh, charged with coming up with treatment strategies for the patients. So the last thing I want to leave you with is just a couple things to think about beyond the kinds of scientific studies that we're doing to look at uh, the connection, the interplay between mechanics and disease. And one of the things that I uh, think is important to think about is the evolution of our understanding of treatment and disease. I draw your attention to a book that was written by Keith Waylu, and the, the title of the book is Dying in the City of the Blues. He actually, he's a social scientist, and he used sickle cell disease as a lens by which to study the intersection between race, policy, and disease. And what he was showing in um, studying, it, it, he did a study in Memphis, he looked at things like um, policies, uh, regulations, and that's one of the reasons why I mentioned the uh, Sickle Cell uh, Act of, of uh, Sickle Cell Control Act in 1972. He looked at how people were being treated, access to um, treatment, to uh, therapies, and how sickle patients might be treated in relation to others. Sickle cell disease is actually noted within the country as a public health concern and a health disparity. And I have been very much interested throughout my career in issues of equity, including issues of equity around health and how the discoveries that we come up with as engineers and scientists, the new technologies, the new advances, the new techniques, how they are accessible to uh, different populations. So I've been following the work of um, Keith Waylu. So one of the things that he talked about when he said invisibility to visibility, we have to pay attention to diseases, and we have to have the kind of structure and support from the government and um, how we fund diseases, how we study them, and how people have access. And I think you can imagine that, just think about what you hear on a regular basis. Which diseases come to mind? What at the forefront? Of course, cancer. But there are other diseases that may affect smaller populations that get more attention just because of how it's positioned politically, for example, or who are the people who are predominantly affected by the disease. And he also talked about, in many ways, how we politicize not just um, broad areas within uh, society, but something as crucial as health, which you think everyone would have the same kinds of um, access. He also talked about looking at sickle cell disease in terms of a history of its progress, uh, but also peril. And the peril, he was bringing in the um, ideas of uh, politics, for example. But sickle cell disease was first discovered 100 years ago. And th with all of the advances that have come with understanding the genetic defect, what's causing the disease, we still are at a very rudimentary stage around treatment and strategies. We're still at a very rudimentary stage of unlocking the mysteries of the biomechanics of cells and tissues that can tell us more about the disease. So there's much more to be done. I became very fascinated with the red blood cell in particular uh, as a graduate student because the red cell, as simple as it seems, it does so much 
and it has so many complications, even though it seems like it's a very simple cell. And interestingly, the red blood cell is one of the, from a biomechanical point of view, is one of the most studied cells in the history of our, our studies of, of uh, cellular biomechanics. And there's more work that's been done on uh, the red blood cell, the mammalian red cell, than almost any other cell. So with that, I uh, want to uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've uh, seen a bit about my own journey towards looking at the interplay between biomechanics and disease, opened your eyes a bit to the mystery of it and what we can continue to do to unlock the mystery of disease using biomechanics and to look at a broader um, scope and our place in society and making a difference. So thank you very much. Gilda, great Hi. talk. Um, so I had a question about your adhesion with white blood cells. And so you had mononuclear cells that were granulocytes where you had higher levels of adhesion than monocytes. But in terms of their size, they're very similar. So I was wondering if it was an adhesion molecule interaction or if it was deformability of the neutrophils or maybe even stacking of the neutrophils that leads to higher levels of occlusion. Right. So we're we, we know more about uh, molecular mechanisms between the red cells and the endothelial cells. We're learning more about which molecules on, on either side of the, the white cell and the red cell are, are playing a role. So we do think there's a molecular interaction, but we're also learning that in addition to the molecular interaction, there are things that are just about the physical mechanics, the trapping based on size. So I'm glad you bring up the idea of size because the white cells are so big. Did you try like GR1 antibody or something like that? We have not, but those are the kinds of uh, steps that we need to do to be able to say definitively um, which one of these uh, molecular interactions are playing a bigger role. probably covered this, but can you tell me if the um, healthy red blood cells convert to sickle cells or they're produced as sickle cells? Okay, so if the, the patient has sickle cell disease, that means they have sickle hemoglobin and every cell that's coming out of their bone marrow has sickle hemoglobin in it. And what happens is every sing single cell with sickle hemoglobin is not always in a polymerized state. So at any given time in the circulation, you'll have a combination of the cells that are actually in the sickle state and some that do you, aren't. Do you know the rate of conversion to, or, or uh, production convert? I mean, is, so what's the ratio and do you know the rate of change of that or? I can't put a time on it, but there, there, there is a particular um, delay time from the time that a cell is in a deoxygenated environment to when it actually sickles. Um, and so there are people who say just the polymerization. And just one other question. If you, if you know, um, if, if these, in your experiments, you can see how these, in fact, have very different uh, physical properties than uh, the healthy cells. Is there any way you can take advantage of that in terms of filtration process or anything that would actually remove them? Or is that just, it's just too uh, pervasive? So the red blood cells um, normally have a lifespan of about 120 days, normally. For a sickle patient, their cells are more fragile and the red blood cells are um, destroyed more rapidly and th therefore it's also a hemolytic uh, disease and that's why it's sickle cell anemia. And, um, but this, one of the therapies that I did not really talk about is transfusion. So you can transfuse and there are many um, sickle patients have had multiple transfusions. But of course the issue with a transfusion is it's temporary because now you've transfused normal red cells with normal mechanical properties, but even those have a, a lifespan of 120 days. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, I didn't talk about this, but there was one strategy that was used um, where a drug, it was a, used in a clinical trial. There was a, a drug called, I believe it was called fluor, fluorocore, but it was a uh, lubricant. And the idea was that can you take a lubricant and it lubricate your cells and therefore um, enhance it or improve the flow? Yeah. 
Gilda, I'm very impressed with the depth of studies that you've done to look at adhesion and inflammation, the biomechanics as well as the flow. And as you're probably well aware, there's a lot of interest in repurposing of drugs. And yes. through some of the systems that you've developed, it seems like you could look at sort of a, a whole array of different maybe anti-inflammatory right. drugs or other sorts of things that you could screen to see how they may affect um, the actual biomechanics, flow, adhesion, and all of these you know, different sort of points that affect the disease and the clinical outcomes. So do you have plans to do that? Is that something that um, has traction? Has you know, the clinical side of, of therapy moved towards you know, testing other types of, of drugs? Yes, absolutely, it has. And so the beauty of, and this is again like an engineering approach, the beauty of being able to have an in vitro system, um, it allows you to do that level of testing. So, so so here's what we do. We typically do this as engineers. You, you break a system down and make it as simple as you can, and then you start trying to add back in. Because you take these very complex systems and you're, it's, so if you had whole blood, for example, and you're trying to say, but what impact does this cell type have versus another blood cell type? Or you, you put an inflammatory mediator in and you're like, well, what cell type is it affecting? The beauty of our system is that we can just take those different pieces out. Like now we're just gonna take this cell type and put this inflammatory mediator in with or without endothelial cells, maybe with or without a protein that's on the matrix. And we can do that and then we can add things back in to help tell this complicated story. Another thing that's starting to happen and, I, and many of you may know about this too, is like I showed you the original parallel plate flow chamber system we were using. That's considered, that's a big, chamber can everything is becoming more miniaturized and so now we use microfluidics but one of the reasons that it helps us to use microsystems one it, it's re recapitulating uh, small vessels but also you use fewer reagents <laughs> you can do higher throughput and that will, allows you to do the kind of testing that you're talking about try different um, drugs that may or may not uh, work under different conditions. So the other thing that we've been trying to do over the years is the conditions. So what are the conditions under which you're more likely to see this type of adhesion, which cell type? And so that your question is spot on, and that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do. Hey, Gilda, can I ask you one more question sure. about the mechanics from the last part of your talk? And so when you see the less stiffening in terms of the mouse model, but it's just a sickle red blood cell, so is it that the red blood cell talking to the osteoblasts is not maturing into clasts, or is there like uh, something with Rantes, or do you know yet whether there's some molecular? Right. So that we don't know. So the first thing we were trying to do is like, okay, first of all, we need to show something about the broader properties in the phenotype. Now that we've done that, the next sets of experiments that we're trying to do is move it to the cellular level and to look at the different cell types, the, the osteocytes, the osteoblasts, in the presence or absence of uh, a mediator or not. And that's where we are right now is to actually try to figure out what mechanism what actually explain is its cell death? Um, what happens in, in presence of a hypoxia or you're, it's not a hypoxic region? And eventually we're also gonna move into the bone marrow which gets even more complicated. Hello, I just wanna say thank you for your, for your talk. Um, my question or rather request is do you have any advice for any as a young budding minority scientist who might find that it's difficult to advance in a career in science due to the political climate or policies surrounding or just in general <laughs> advice. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, uh, speaking from my own experience, I think that part of what we need to do is find good relevant problems that we're interested in devoting our research careers to. That, that's one piece of it. Doing the best work that we can do. Um, excellence 
no one can um, argue with excellence. And so that's one piece of it. I think connecting to those who can be our advocates, it could be um, the right advisor, it could be a peer mentor, it could be a higher level mentor, but to the extent that we can, uh, joining environments that we know that are, uh, at least have some evidence of being supportive of people from different backgrounds, I absolutely do th think that makes a huge difference especially for students, even if it's at the undergraduate or graduate level, if you're gonna take your time to join a laboratory, for example, don't join one where there's a question about the commitment to the success of all of the students. And so I tell, sometimes I get asked, what's more important, the project or the advisor? The advisor. <laughs> you, you can change your project. You can't change that advisor, who that person is, you know? And, and oftentimes it's about fit. There needs to be a sense of community and oftentimes I think it's important if the community doesn't already exist, then let's build it. And the, you can't underestimate the importance of uh, support. We're not islands. Science is social, engineering is social. We operate on problems collectively and so I tell those who are interested in joining the field, like, let's be part of that team, but let's not uh, think that we have to do it by ourselves and look for uh, the support where we can find it. Thank Does you. that help a bit? Yes, thank you. Since sickle cells, as I understand it, tend to adhere to the blood vessel walls, can you do something like dialysis? so that the sickle cells would adhere to the, blood vessel, to the walls in the dialysis machine and neural red blood cells would come out. So I don't know that people have thought of it from the dialysis uh, point of view, but I, because pretty much, you know, we've been looking at like transfusions. Um, for some reason, so sickle cell patients can have every complication there is and they, they're, um, they don't tend to be on dialysis as often as um, you would think for the kinds of complications that they have. But to your point about the concept, the concept of like dialysis, like removing cells, um, there's been some talk about that, but no one's sort of figured out like exactly how to do it. But if, is there a way to take the bad actors out? And Isn't that what you were just showing? That they take themselves out on the cell walls? Well, but they're, they're adhering to the vessel walls, but they are uh, doing it in a way that they're participating in, in blockages of the vessels. So they might not be in the flow anymore, but that's because they're blocking that vessel and oxygen's not getting to the tissues. Right, but I was thinking if you could recreate that so the sickle cells would adhere to the tubing that they were flowing through and the normal cells would not, not get stuck. So you mean like in an extracorporeal way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, analogous to a dialysis, dialysis machine. Sure. So we don't have a lot of experience with that, but theoretically you would think that concept would work. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I have to play with that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the percentage of, uh, if somebody has, I, have, I had a cousin who died of sickle cells, so what is the percentage of sickle cells um, resident in, uh, in a body? So if you, know, you have 10 quarts of blood or however many quarts of blood, you know, how much of that uh, has sickle cell in it? So, Which is you know, an ignorant sounding sort of question. So but. typically what the kind of information we have is like you take a sample, you separate out um, cells, like I showed you the density. So you separate cells out by density and they'll, you can get percentages of each cell type. So, and then you can add those together and, and, and figure out. So for a sickle patient, they might have like 20% of their cells that are irreversibly sickle, for example. And then another percent um, that are the reticulocytes. The reticulocytes are gonna be much higher than you would think. It might be like 20, 30%, which is higher than normal. But the reason why the percentage of reticulocytes, those young red blood cells are so high in sickle patients is because there's because it's a hemolytic anemia and the cells are constantly being destroyed, so the body's constantly producing new cells. Um, so there, 
at any given, for any given patient? So I'm thinking about the ones that are like in the sickle uh, shape. Uh, that's probably a high percentage, but because 100% of them have sickle hemoglobin, but the ones that are actually sickled or are higher density might be 50 to 80%. I'm basically riffing on that stuff. Yes. Right. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, what's the first symptom of sickle cell anemia, and is there like a biomechanical reason that that's the first symptom? So, in kids, um, so the, the big symptom actually is pain. So these vasoclusive crises, um, you're not getting um, any uh, oxygen to these tissues, and particularly in joint areas. So the big s symptom is pain and pain in joints. And oftentimes in children, it doesn't manifest right away because we have fetal hemoglobin, and then the fetal hemoglobin will last for a certain time, and then it turns over. So someone might have fetal hemoglobin that hasn't turned over to the adult hemoglobin for a couple months. And in fact, in Africa in particular, there were many kids babies, infants that were dying of sickle cell disease before they were ever diagnosed. Because it started out, it seemed normal, and then they would have these um, crises. Um, in, in small kids, you often see swelling in the hands because in the joint area, there's a lot of uh, swelling. So those are some of the signs that you see. And the clinical manifestations can be very early on. There's a lot of variability in the disease, though. So what you might see in one patient, you don't necessarily see in another. So there's a lot of patient-to-patient -patient variability. And even for the same patient, there's a lot of variability over time. So someone with the disease might be in the hospital constantly for a few months in a row with debilitating crises, and then the next month be much better off. And we don't have a predictor. And so some of the work that we're trying to do is to continue to look at what might be a predictor, and so the reason why we're looking at biomechanics is like, could that be a predictor? Is there some clue hidden there that could help tell you, well, if this happens mechanically, then this might be the onset of uh, disease or, or a manifestation of the disease? Um, hi, so I was thinking about this. If you're looking at the actual structure of the flow over these particles, the sickle cells, the drugs that are given, are they actually affecting the cell itself or the flow of the blood? Right. Because the, the question is, is it shrinking the sickle cell so that the blood flows over faster the way it should so that the other normal cells can flow through? Right. What exactly is happening with so, the drug? So there's different drugs, and the different drugs target different things. So you might have a drug that's targeting sickling. So it's an anti-sickling drug. And so that drug would be um, keeping the cell from sickling. You might, like the ones that I showed you, was it's targeting adhesion. So it's attacking uh, a mechanism where instead of getting the adhesion, you put some anti-antagonist, um, so now you don't get the adhesion. The one that I mentioned that they said it was a lubricant, in that case, they were like, okay, this is gonna make things more slippery. So it depends on what you're targeting. One of the first things that they looked at, just as, just in the laboratory, what can uh, keep a cell from sickling? Urea. Urea is a fantastic anti-sickler, but urea is toxic. So, so it really depends on what it is you're targeting. Thank you for the talk. Uh, this question is not so much likely to come from your, oh, your research, but so most of the research that I've heard, I heard to describe, I would say, would be pro prophylactic in nature, that you're trying to actually uh, eliminate the underlying cause. But of course, another form of treatment would simply be maintenance. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, I'm curious whether you're aware of, uh, of people possibly using nanotechnology to actually uh, oxygenate the hypoxia. That is, mm -hmm. we might imagine that we're using some nanotechnology that you could actually get more oxygen into the sickle cell the ones that are reversible right. and thereby lower the percentage. Do you know of any research like that going on? I don't, but that's a great idea. Um, how do you manipulate 
what's going on in the cell in terms of uh, the way the hemoglobin can carry or not carry oxygen, right? Yeah, so th I don't know um, if there's any work in that vein, but that's definitely a reasonable strategy because it is all about the oxygen. So organizer's uh, prerogative. Um, you also <laughs> spoke about um, asymptomatic, uh, yes. so carrying the trait. And I was really curious about the, uh, the bone studies. It uh, looked like there were differences just by carrying the trait. Right. And I assume the carrying the trait means there are no sickle cells or fewer? I'm asking because I, I really don't know. <laughs> so if they're carriers, that means that they have in each of their cells some sickle and some normal hemoglobin. What happens is if you have any amount of hemoglobin other than sickle, it serves as any amount. It serves as a protection against um, the severity of sickling. And so, so for example, hydroxyurea, one of the ways hydroxyurea works is because it upregulates fetal hemoglobin. So now even though it's uh, an adult setting, the percentage of fetal hemoglobin in the presence of the fetal hemoglobin along with the sickle hemoglobin dampens the effect of sickle hemoglobin. So now those who are carriers with the trait, we think that, okay, they are not having the manifestations because there's the amount of sickle is just not at a level to have these uh, manifestations. So then they st pretty much don't look at, we don't have to do anything for the people who are carriers because they're going to be asymptomatic. But then there are problems that you don't see. So it's now a, a case where maybe we should start studying trait because there could be silent things that we're not being, that not being picked up. Um, because th it is known that if you're in depressurized environments, someone who is just a carrier may have what looks like a crisis. And so now for this work that we saw with the bone, we're thinking, wow, maybe there's something that we should be looking at for carriers uh, and other tissues as well. So there's a mechanical correlate for carriers. That's really what I'm asking. So it's not that they don't have any sickles. They do have sickle. That's right. But at right. a much lower level. Right, exactly. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you again. And thank and you for thank coming. And thank you all very much. Thank you.